is my opinion uh, on myositis uh, and infection. And then I'll show you only, I won't bore you with data from literature and evidence and all that, except for one paper that I'll show you because, not only because I was author on, but just to impress on you the significance of infection and myositis. And hopefully all of you are already alert, vigilant about it, uh, uh, even before this conversation. And I think one of the reasons you, I would suspect you're alert, you wouldn't be here if you didn't, didn't worry about infections. This is kind of a list of all of my titles. That's who I am. I'm Maisen Dimashki. It's a tongue twister. That's the Lebanese name. I took my medical degree from the American University of Beirut in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, did my fellowship and residency training in neurology. I'm a neurologist. At this meeting, you'll see neurologist, hematologist, uh, dermatologist, and one specialist, pulmonologist. I'm a neurologist. And, uh, I've, you know, now it's been 23 years since I've graduated from my fellowship training, and I've had an interest in muscle disease. My website is certainly in doing muscle biopsies, reading muscle biopsies, something that I've been uh, interested in for a long period of time. So, over time, if you ask me 22 years ago, what my disclosures are, there would be blank slide. But I've been active in the last 22 years, so I've been involved in different federally funded studies, TNA funded studies, and other uh, pharma funded studies that are listed here as part of my disclosures, none of which I think will interfere with my ability to give you a bland, neutral presentation about infection and myositis, but I have to disclose them at any meeting. So I said it's going to be interactive, so we're going to start by talking about you being involved and raising your hands and contributing to the conversation. Okay? Everybody's excited. There's, there's no wrong answer, okay? Who has Polly in the audience? Okay, one, two, three, okay. How about Bernardo? Quite a few more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Necrotizing autoimmune myopathy. One, two. So three, nine, and two. That's 14. I see more than four. What about inclusion body myositis? Okay. That's another four, five. So we're up to 19. You could have some carriers. Uh -huh. So who are the caregivers? That, that's very important, okay? And who are none of the above that are here but the <laughs> Get out of this. <laughs> so what are treatments for polymyositis and dermatomyositis and necrotizing autoimmune myopathy? I have just excluded five of you, and I'm sorry about that, because the truth is for Inclusion body myositis. I ask you who has inclusion body myositis. The caregivers don't worry about. The caregivers want them to be healthy, right? But the IDMers, so far, we don't have a effective therapy that works well for IDM. But for those that have PM, DM, and necrotizing autoimmune myopathy, there are different uh, drugs. I mean, all of us should be active physically, right? But from drug therapy standpoint, what are the drugs that work for these? Conditions that we know. Cell 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 Reduction. There's a study on reduction. Imuran, is a fibrin. IDIG. Yes. IDIG. Okay, great. So, usually when I think of that, prednisone, right? That's kind of the. You, you guys do prednisone, but you didn't think of it. Everybody it's so obvious, right? <laughs> But that's the obvious. Sometimes prednisone or IP methyl prednisolone, um, second line therapies, uh, methoprexate, isotypin, which is imuran, right? IVIG, uh, microfilate mofetil, another name for CELSEF, right? And then there are third line therapies. Rituximab was mentioned. There are others. Cy cytoxin. How many of you have been on cytoxin? <laughs> We don't use it commonly. It's kind of pretty drastic to use cytoxin for myositis. It's kind of a last resort, one of those last drugs you think about. There's an Ambro, Etanercept. There's a study that we participated in, Dr. Amato from the Brigham 
and women in Boston uh, was the lead investigator looking at uh, using Enbrel, um for for dermatomyositis. Tacrolimus is kind of similar to cyclosporin, it's super cyclosporin, 100 times more efficacious, to the dose is 100 times slower or smaller than, than uh, that of cyclosporin. Uh, ACTH gel, Actar gel, how many of you have taken or are on Actar gel? Not used commonly, right? You don't have Bactrim on the list. I'm taking it only because of the potential. Bactrim, that's a good question. Let's go on a tangent here for a bit, because what he's talking about is the question is, what about Bactrim? It's not on the list, which is, by the way, not finished yet, but it's not going to be on the finished list uh, either. So, uh, how many of you take Bactrim? One, two, three, four, five, okay. How many of you don't take back to? Quite a few. Why is it that some of you are taking it and others aren't taking it? Yeah, I stopped when I stopped prednisone. I'm sorry? I stopped taking it once I was only on cell set, but not on cell set. Right. So, the pulmonologist said to take the back So, the pulmonologist said take back turn because of lung involvement. Yeah. Okay, good. Stopped. So, you had and interstitial lung disease and myositis, so they were worried about that. It turns out there's a lot of variation on the use of Bactrim. If you look across physicians, there's some that would like to use it when you're on double therapies, and others that say the evidence is weak. There was a review that looked at that. And it's okay to take it, but I want you, those that are not taking it, not to feel like, oh my God, let me call my doctor right now, I can get out of this meeting. <laughs> because it, the, the, the study, is, there, there was a, a retrospective look at all studies of <coughs> prophylaxis with Bactrim to prevent, by the way, why do we do that? It's to prevent a specific type of opportunistic lung infection, right? It's called PJP pneumonia. Uh, it used to be called PCP pneumonia, but they changed the name. It's pneumocystis carini type of, it's a weird bug that normally does not infect people, but when you're immunosuppressed, whether from HIV or double immunosuppression, you're at higher risk of death. But the study that, the retrospective study that looked at all those exposures of patients that have taken it and have not taken it, has identified that if your lymphocyte count is low, meaning below 800, that's when you're at higher risk, but otherwise there's not clear evidence to support that if your lymphocyte count is higher than that, that you would benefit from the prophylaxis. I've offered it to some patients, some patients say yes, some patients say no. And again, not very consistent in offering to all patients, I have to say, admit to that. So it's something that you can discuss with your physician based on your own personal profile of how your immunosuppression is, what your white counts are showing in the way of results to. Has anybody developed PCP pneumonia in the audience? No. So even those that have not taken those, that drug have not. So this is kind of where it's a small benefit and then it's a subpopulation of benefits, but sometimes people give it, physicians administer it, sometimes <coughs> they don't. And even when we, I have recommended it to patients, some patients will say, you know what, no, I don't want to take that risk. Or they may have allergies to that, they go to the second line and they have concerns about it, so those kinds of things. So what about the fourth line? This is a bit more kind of experimental. Uh, there's a study of an interleukin-6 receptor blocker that Dr. Otis from the University of Pittsburgh is leading the effort on uh, that's called There is a pharma study where, as a disclosure, we're part of the site uh, for that study of um, IMO 8400. It's a whole like receptor inhibitor. It's a way to suppress your immunity. And there's a on, uh, BMS, Bristol Myers Squibbs, uh, has a study of this drug, Avetacept, also, <coughs> in dermatomyositis, as to whether this is uh, effective. So, of all these drugs, this is the question now, pay attention, okay? Of all these drugs, which suppress your immune system? Well, first and second. Any other answers? All of them. All of them, right. That's the correct answer. All of them suppress your immune system. Yes. That's a good point. Does IVIG suppress your immunity? I was told that. 
So it kind of modulates your immunity. We think. So of those, the least evil in my mind is IBIG. However, is it totally a safe proposition? I'm not sure. But I tend to feel a little bit more comfortable when I speak with the infectious disease doctors, even if someone has an infection and is a flare-up of their myositis, that they seem to be more comfortable <coughs> with IVIG. So all of them suppress your immunity, probably less in the case of IVIG because it modulates it, it fine tweaks it, there's a risk. But you always, in anything in life, I mean, there's a risk in driving a car, right? So nobody should drive cars, right? To avoid accidents, right? Okay. Well, we'd be all at home and be here. So it's a risk benefit. <coughs> so this is only for myositis patients. Uh, but, but the caregivers can give, try to whisper the answers to them, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before starting uh, immunosuppression, <laughs> You should get tested with a either PPD skin test, which is a tuberculin skin test. You may be familiar with that term. Or that quantifuron TB test is a blood test uh, for tuberculosis. Or one or the other. Or that's that either. Right, not, let's not worry about that. What should the answer be? C. A or B. Okay, that's the right answer. C, A or B. How many of you have had A or B? Some sort of TB test. Mm -hmm. Right. So not many. And then again, that reflects some inconsistency uh, from us physicians. Even when I look within my group, we have, we're grown to be 10 neuromuscular specialists in my division at the University of Kansas <coughs> Medical Center. And uh, if I look around at physicians within the division, some of us are more religious or compulsive about getting that, and others are less compulsive about getting that test before you start the uh, immunosuppression. So I think for young myositis patients or myositis patients that are new to the disease, it's important to keep that in mind that this is a way to uh, really anticipate, prevent issues. So. What I've seen it come back positive is mostly from Eastern European immigrants. Um, I've had a couple of patients like that where I've done it on the Brazilian patients, and the ones that turn out positive are those that are coming from that area that may be carriers for tuberculosis, they don't know it. And all it means is they need to take a second drug as they take their immunosuppression, a drug to prevent tuberculosis from flaring up, and it's a three, six month treatment period I usually refer the patients to my friendly infectious disease specialist and say, we have a situation here. I would like to start prednisone on this patient. When can you see them so that we can start them? And usually within a few days of them starting the uh, uh, drug for tuberculosis prevention from it flaring up, then I can start them on prednisone. Not much delay involved, in other words, in treating someone who needs therapy for their uh, myositis. Once you're on the once you're on the uh, drugs, is it still wise to go back and get the testing? If you is it wise to get tested if you're on the drugs? So, uh, yes, with some limitations. Uh, the limitation is that once you are on those immunosuppressants, it suppresses all different things, including your response to the tuberculin skin test, including the quantifiron TB test. But if they're positive, then it tells you something. Because what you don't want is the tuberculosis to flare up, become disseminated tuberculosis and spread everywhere. And then one of the, back in the, I think, early uh, 20th century, one of the president's wives experienced that. And actually, she died from that stage, you know, US presidents. So uh, it can be serious. So something to keep in mind. Um, Again, if you are from a uh, third world country that's probably originated from that, that's more of a concern, you know. Now, as, as part of most applications to any employment, you almost, you get a tuberculin skin test. So it could be that you already have had that done, but not as part of this, because of the variation in physician practices, too. So this year, who has had only one infection in 2017? That's two hands, three hands, four, four people. One, two, three, four, five, okay, six. 
How about multiple infections? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And so seven and six, 13 out of 19. So infection is not a, you know, not uncommon problem. But if you kind of look, generally speaking, people get infection, right? I mean, how many people get the flu? How many people get a urinary tract infection? Even without immunosuppression. So is this above and beyond the, the natural rate of infection uh, that people get? We don't know. But how many of you did not have any infection in the last last year? I guess I'll ask the question to define infection. Yeah. Because you, know, you get cuts and, you know, as long as there's no pus coming out of it, I deem that is not an infection. I think the question is about cuts. Is this a cut that gets inflamed but does not have pus coming out from it? Uh, consist of an infection, and I think that inflammation is part of the when it gets red, angry looking, and it's healing. It's part of the normal healing process, and hopefully you can do this inflammation to heal type of process too. So the white cells chew up the bad debris, and then there's healing going on with growth of blood vessels across the area of the cut. But if it is looking swollen, red, angry, discharging pus, that's clearly an infection. And there's of course where I don't know, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, right? Okay, so the redness though is just the normal. Right, depends how much redness. If it's one or two millimeters around the edge of an incision or around the edge of the cut, I know that because I do muscle biopsies, so sometimes I'm kind of need to look and see if a biopsy site doesn't look really well as to whether there is or not an infection. So if it's within one or two millimeter from the edge of the uh, cut, I consider it normal healing, whereas if right. it's spreading out uh, half an inch away from the line of the cut, I know we have a bigger problem in my mind. Okay, so quite a few of you have had an infection uh, this year. We're going to talk more about those infections, types of infections, I think is the next thing. How many, was it a cold or bronchitis or a flu type of thing? Okay, this is quite well, a few. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> one, two, three. Yeah, it's just a cold just cold. Count a little bit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That's the overwhelming majority. Right? And that's what you would expect. People get colds, right? Very tract infections. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Urine tract infection is number two. Intestinal infection, diarrhea, vomiting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. That's a, that's a strong second, yeah. Other infections that are not listed here. What other infections? Staph infection. Staph infection. Was it in the blood or was it in the space around the orbits, uh, the face area? Okay. How about you? Histoplasmosis. Histoplasmosis. What is histoplasmosis? Was it in the lungs? It's systemic. Systemic histoplasmosis. What is that? Is that a normal infection? It's not an infection that normal people get it, except if you're immunosuppressed in some way, for the most part. Yeah. So if you have an infection, um, and you're taking multiple uh, immunosuppressive drugs, not just prednisone, prednisone plus something else, let's say. Uh, what type of infection are, are you at risk of? Is it a regular cold? or UTI, an opportunistic infection, or both of those? Oh, both. both, right. So the increased risk is for both, but what about, what's an opportunistic infection? <laughs> you said for both, but you kind of trust them. You got a little weakness and it jumps in. So it's kind of like what he said, a little weakness that jumps in. The weakness is, it occurs when it's the immune system, is weakened, and those double immunosuppressants will weaken the immune system. Even single immunosuppression with prednisone will do some of that too. Because that's what we're trying to do in fighting myositis, because myositis is a wrapped up immune system, and we're just trying to push that back and suppress it, right? But along the way, one of the things that gets suppressed is your response to fight infection, your body response, natural response to fight infections. So if you have an infection and are taking immunosuppressive drugs, the result is that, this is kind of an obvious question because we're going to talk about, you can normally fight an infection, 
you can fight it even better. Now you can use the The body is weakened by fighting the infection. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, of course, all of you got the right answer. Um, if you have an infection or taking an immunosuppressive drug, the result is that your body temperature, when you get a fever, we get a fever when you have an infection, right? Your fever will be even higher because of the immunosuppressant. It may be about the same fever you would have if you didn't have a immunosuppressant. Or it will be even not really raising your temperature that much because you're taking an immunosuppressant. What do you think is the answer? Yes. So the symptoms of infection that you experience are lesser. Even when you look at blood parameters that shows evidence of infection, they're not as strong compared to when you don't take immunosuppressants. So when they suppress your immunity, these drugs also suppress your response to infection, and fever is one of those fundamental signs uh, that we look for, so they get less of that. But what other things you may experience are when you're sick, besides fever, indirect evidence of fever are what? Chills, mm -hmm. night sweats, <laughs> right? So this is when you take, I take my temperature and the temperature is normal, but I, ha I feel like I have a fever. Well, feeling hot. I mean, but I haven't, I'm having all the responses of fever, but. So that could be a reason why Ultimately, a day or two later, now the burning and urination becomes more obvious, or a day or two later, cough becomes more obvious, or the diffuse no, aches and malaise, not. or the nausea and vomiting become more obvious. So your response to infection is weakened. Uh, your response to infection is also delayed. Uh, and then so you, so you, this is kind of brings up some of the next few points we will talk about. Yes. Where, Anybody else? So this is again for myositis patients. Only when taking an immunosuppressive drug reasons for, this is kind of a bit medical, technical, but I think it's important for you to know, what are the reasons that you are at risk or increased risk of infection? Is this because of a low white cell count? Those drugs may suppress your low white cell count. I see some heads. Uh, agreeing with this uh, answer. Lower neutrophil count. The neutrophils are those cells that fight bacterial infection. Right? Lower neutrophil count, yes, I see. That's being nodded here. How about lymphocyte counts being low? Is that an issue? This is, remember when we talked about opportunistic infections, viral infections, also tend to be more common with lower uh, lymphocyte count. So, yes. How about if you don't produce antibodies? For example, rituximab was mentioned. Uh, it's a depleter of B cells. B cells are the precursors to cells that are called plasma cells. Plasma cells are professional producers of antibodies. So, yes. And so it's all of these, right? This is the, all the kind of medical reasons as to why your immune system uh, response is weakened in the setting of double immune suppression. Uh, for, for D there, what item would you look at in your blood work to, to see if that's the case? Is there an item you can measure in the bloodstream to document D? And the answer is no. Because the immunoglobulin levels will change a little bit, but still will be within the normal range. So you cannot exactly measure it, except if in rituximab, sometimes they measure IgG or IgM antibodies, but still, it's not really uh, as easy as that. And I made it simple. It may sound simple, to be honest with you, in the way of saying, well, you get reduction of B, uh, B cells with rituximab, and you have low antibodies, but the way the drug works on your immunity may be much more complicated than that. Um. If I was taking high dose prednisone when I had a blood draw for the myositis antibody panel, would I get accurate results? So this is an antibody infection. So there's something called myositis specific antibodies, right? 
who does not know about myocardial specific event? It's okay not to know. You're here to learn about things. So these are a set of antibodies that can be seen in anywhere from 20 to 70 percent of patients with myositis. Why is it so broad? Why is it so different? Because if you look across the board, depending which condition you belong or group you belong in, the percent is different. For example, in polymyositis, it's 20 percent. Dermatomyositis is 70 percent. Inclusion body myositis is 30 to 40 percent. And then in necrotizing autoimmune myopathy, it's about two-thirds of the patients that will have an antibody. Okay, now, if you are measuring an antibody and you're suppressing the immunity of the individual, could it be that the antibody can come back negative? I see head nodded. Yes, I agree with the expert. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it can be weakened. It can be either negative or it can be, when you measure titers, how high they are, they can still be positive, but in a lower positive range, yes. So it's best to measure those before. But if you're already on treatment, then either you decide not to measure it at all, uh, or to go for it, understanding that there are, again, limitations. Would, would, would that mess up a, the taking of the antibody test then? That's what we're yeah. exactly yeah. pointing yeah. out. So it I would mess it up. It would make it less likely to, to show, show you the result. Okay. To be positive. Because I've never gotten a clear answer on the, the, they did the antibody test on me and said, oh, don't worry about it. Everything's negative. Okay, okay. good. So all my satisfactions, raise your hand. All of you. Okay. Oh, all my satisfactions. All my satisfactions. Okay, good. Those that had antibody tested, keep your hands up. Okay. Those that have positive antibodies, keep your hands up. So it's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine, about half, half the patients roughly uh, had a positive antibody when tested. So there you go. This is that range that I gave you depending on the subcategory of Well, what disease. bothers me is they say, well, everything's negative. And I say, well, negative for what? And that's what I don't get the answer for. I just don't, it's just negative. Uh, so this is kind of the good thing about coming to a conference like this. Hopefully you get closer to answers. Yeah, there's a, you know, later on I'm supposed to get that answer. Right, okay. <laughs> no, there's, there's, a, there's a Q and A session on the, for just for antibodies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'll hold the question. Who, who's given it? Is it Dr. Oh. Mamen or? It's too early in the morning to ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> I can look it up. So. No, that's okay. But I mean, the, the uh, myocytes advisory board members are really experts internationally in the field, so you have really great answers at this meeting to your questions. Of course, if you ask me, how do I manage my myositis, this and this, I'll say, check with your doctor. That's not what this conference is about. It's not about getting private consultation. It's actually coming up uh, later today. Mazafar? Tassil Mozafar. Yeah, from the University of California, Irvine. Yes. You, you, you have you know, <coughs> great time visiting with have a great time. Excellent teacher. <laughs> <laughs> So talking of great time, I'm, I'm glad we're not on the East Coast, right? We'll be all packing and leaving for you. Right? So forget the conference, right? Hopefully, anybody has family, friends? On we're from Miami. We came up. Oh. My daughter's leaving Miami right now. I have Good. a friend, a physician, that it's I came so back right in now. 1996 that I've been in touch with. He's scared to, out of his wits with what's going on there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hang in there. Yeah. Hopefully it'll turn. Hopefully. Yeah. Go back to Texas or something. Yeah. Texas needs it the second time. Oh, it's already damaged, so why not? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Where do you live? Uh, Kansas. So, so like if our house is destroyed, we're going to come live with you for a while. <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Say, okay, I'm closing my practice. I'm moving to Kansas. That's it. <laughs> So, but uh, yeah, I used to live in Houston for 17 years, so yeah. I moved away at the right time. I, I went through one hurricane, uh, actually it wasn't a hurricane, it was a tropical storm. It flooded the medical center, we shut down for about a month. And after that, that's back in 2000, 
this was done, they did all these protective barriers for the medical center this way. And generators, they moved them from the basement where they would shut down once flooded to the top of the buildings. So they were ready for the storm when it came. So they didn't get much disruption uh, uh, for the most part. Ben Pop, I think, had to evacuate patients. This is like a county hospital. Uh, so I stay in touch with my friends in Houston. So yeah, it's, it's a big, big problem. I mean, those storms. Going back to my side, this is not what you came to hear about, right? <laughs> if you have an infection, the best approach is ignore it. <laughs> ignore it, right? It's like your it's best key friend that you want to get rid of, right? Just keep on ignoring them and then they'll just keep on, right? <laughs> or stay right, you know, it just helps. It makes you feel good, right? Practice yoga. Yoga strengthens your immunity. It will help you fight infections. Right? Yes. Seek help with your primary care doctor in the next couple of weeks. You know, you're too busy. Why let things slow you down? Just let it wait. That's assuming you can get in to see your primary care doctor. Right. Exactly. So how difficult is it for you? To get in to see your primary you, care. Usually, you can get to see one of their associates. Right. Okay. And then you see an associate. Uh, do you live in Virginia or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I live in a big metropolitan area. Lots okay. of doctors. Up there. Lots of doctors. Yeah. It's hard to get in to see physicians really quickly, and it's one of the challenges. And typically, what we try to do is when we get a message about a pressing issue, I just. You know, you have to accommodate patients. You have to overbook, double overbook, triple overbook. Especially when you know your patients, you, kind of, you have to treat them like family. That's, that's the bottom line. And then seek the help of your primary care physician as soon, ASAP means as soon as possible, like, you know, very quick. So the obvious answer, right? Right. Well, when you said temperature, now that's usually the big indicator that, yeah, I better see a doctor right away. Is you're talking like 105, 103? I'm not talking about 120. Yeah, well, then we wouldn't be talking. I mean, anything above 99.5 is considered low grade fever. Yeah. So, but some people will tell me my normal temperature is 97. When I go to 97.5, for me, this is a fever. First, I would look at it and think this years ago, you know. With gray hairs, you get different things happening. One of the benefits, not the negatives, one of the five benefits of gray hairs is you kind of learn from your patients, learn from experience. So in the big past, I would just say, oh, wow, well, that's a weirdo question. Let's move on. But I hear from patient after patient, so I have to believe it, that some patients, their normal body temperature is lower, and then it can go up a little bit just to indicate that they're getting into a trouble with infection. So, but generally, 99.5 would be kind of the threshold after which you'd say, well, I'm having a low rate fever. Yes. Question there? Yeah, I mean, so before this disease, um, if I would get a cold or a flu, I would sort of like wait a little bit and let my body go through its healing process. And, and even a fever of 100 or 101, I would go, okay, that's, you know, rest, fluids, blah, blah, blah. And now, we, if I'm understanding you, you're saying with dermatomyositis, don't wait. You know, be more vigilant. Is, I mean, is that what you're saying? Kind of, in a way, yes. But with some, some conflict. So let me rephrase your question. Most of you heard it, but just in case on the recording it didn't come out. The question is, well, should you, at the drop of a hat, just contact your physician at the earliest sign of an infection because in her experience, before myositis, she would get symptoms of infection, they would clear up within a few days, and she'd be fine. <clears throat> now, I think that the right answer is, is, is now that she has myositis, should she do it differently? Should she just yeah. do everything at the drop of her hand? And I think that if it's someone is getting a urinary tract infection, Mm -hmm. Obviously, it doesn't take care of itself, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something where you need to be doing answer E in this case. Uh, if someone is having a gastrointestinal infection, sometimes it clears itself within a few days, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But if you're having a bronchitis, you're coughing, and then 
say it usually clears for you within two, three days. Mm -hmm. And now it's day three and you're getting worse. Mm -hmm. The answer becomes E. Okay. So I'm trying to keep it simple here yeah. in this slide, but we have kind of, I'm glad you asked that question mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. both answers, D and E, not quite one or two weeks, right? But D within a few days of seeing how the force of the problem is going because you're not going to lose much within two, three days if it's a respiratory infection. It's going to declare itself either it's going better or getting worse, right? And most of those respiratory infections are what? They're kind of viral infections. Antibiotics you take, what the doctors prescribe you typically is antibiotics. Are they effective for viral infections? They're not. Very good question. There was another question in the back. Was it the same or different? No, I, I was wondering, my temperature goes to the 96 range since diagnosis. I actually almost threw away like six thermometers because I thought clearly all the yeah. batteries were. Yeah. You know, have you had much experience? When I feel like I have a fever of 105, it's actually like 96. Yes. It's really yeah. bizarre. So have you had the that? The normal temperature before the 96 is usually 97 and a half. So it right. drops it like a point down. So I'm going to put it in the category of I've heard it for the first time from a patient. I'm going to take it with a grain of salt, and then with the next patient, the next patient, I'm going to learn more about it. There's two to now. Now that's definitive <laughs> evidence, right? <laughs> but but <Already> sometimes <laughs> severe hypothermia can be an indication. It's kind of the flip side of having a fever. Some people mm -hmm. react differently. Um, so. Yeah. I have the same thing. Yeah, yes. low temperature. That's three. Yes. So I have a question about I think the, the that was your question, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Of the immediate care. So so you immediately seek the care of a primary care doctor because you have a you have a really bad cough. And they just say they they can't help you because it's viral. So I guess I have that question. I immediately seek the care of the primary care doctor and they, they are like they're like, well, right. they want to give me uh, antibiotics. Check with your a rheumatologist because they're treating you for the myositis. Well, how do you get in to see the rheumatologist oh, yeah. and drop my hat, you know, hi, you know. Right. So, <laughs> so I, I guess that, that's my, like, I'm like, that's why I try to figure out what to do because if you drop off a hat every time I get a cough, I'm like, what do I... That to me doesn't seem like... Exactly. That's a very good point. I hear my patients saying that, you know, and sometimes they come back to me complaining. I, I get those electronic medical records charts. You asked me to check with my primary care about this infection. They told me not to worry about it. I'm yeah. now worried. Now I'm in the thick of it, trying to call the primary care physician, educate them about the situation. So it could not be that you need a visit with your rheumatologist, neurologist, whoever that's taking care of your myositis primarily, but this is where you need to kind of engage them in that conversation that my primary care is not really responsible. It could be that this is the right response. Again, if it's a respiratory infection in the first day or two, it could be the right response. But on the other hand, if it is something that's getting worse, that's a different story. And when I've spoken with the primary care physicians, they've been very amenable to be, the, uh, be quite responsive to those things. Yes, I think you had a question. Um, it was more of a comment. Um, what <clears throat> my situation is rather complex, and I agree. I, I utilize um, numerous specialists, but my nucleus is the rheumatologist, and from there you pivot to those that are specialized in certain areas. And in my instance, I have an internist, but if I have a lung infection, obviously I would be going to my pulmonologist um, because that individual will know more so the pattern of my scenario. And before um, myositis, when I had bronchitis, yes, it lasted a week or two. It does not do that now. It lasts six months. So there, as he mentioned, <coughs> E and D is pivotal. And you really have to pay attention and learn and know your body. And in regards to the low temperature, yes, I always had a low body temperature. So you're not abnormal. That's your new you, if that is the case. Um, but don't throw any more away. No, I didn't it changes um, from time to time. 
But you know, I instruct nurses when I'm hospitalized or having any procedure because my norm is 97.1. Yes, I drop into 96, 90, sorry, 95, and may go up to 98, but that is not my norm. So if I have a fever, I know I have a fever, but they're looking for something much higher. Yeah. So be aware of yourself. Yeah, that's very good. Nice comments. Particularly, how many of you have interstitial lung disease? So, should you wait two, three days when you have a cold if you have interstitial lung disease? No. Because this is something that's, a, again, a high risk subpopulation of myositis that with interstitial lung disease it can be a bad year. Thank you for pointing that out. You're more than okay. Who is your next, I think, and then you and then you and then you go to the next slide. So what would the primary care doctor do if they were realized they had to act when you come in after two or three days of okay. And it's getting worse over there. Right. So since I'm not a primary care physician, I'm going to tell you the answer that I think they would do, but I don't know for sure they would do. So, should they do an x-ray of your chest, for example? Possibly. Possibly. If they listen to your lungs first, they should examine you first, right? Listen to your lungs, measure your temperature. They may do some blood work. They may or may not do a chest x-ray, depending how the overall examination looks like. If they believe it's upper airway, sinuses, or lung infection may act to it differently. And then depending on um, what your previous experience with the infection is, meaning are you allergic to certain antibiotics or not? Um, are you more responsive to certain antibiotics? Have your bugs you've been previously exposed to be more resistant to one type of antibiotic as opposed to the other? That's why I need a primary care to be involved. And certainly if it's more complicated than that, I have a low threshold to refer patients to an infectious disease specialist. They are friends, they help us with our minor satisfactions. I have to say, generally speaking, that's not that often. Who's next? Uh, I'm a retired family practice physician, and I can tell you that the immunosuppressed patient, and you don't have very many of them, even in a huge panel, are a nightmare just because of this. You know, you've got somebody who comes in nice and early with something that probably is viral and probably is going to go away. And you're being told by all of the, the gurus you should not overprescribe antibiotics and you've got somebody that probably really does need them. So I think the, the baseline is you need to really have a good relationship with your primary care so that they know you, because you've got people who come in at the drop of a hat when there's nothing wrong with them, and people who wait until they're damn near dead. And so you have to have this threshold of knowing when somebody is really getting sick and listening to them. You know, when somebody says, I have a gut feeling this is a nasty, then you go ahead and get aggressive. Um, I love it that we didn't plant her in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your comments. This is perfect. You know, now you can see where the, this is kind of the yin yang because everything's viral. Let's not treat anything. And then the reality that you have this very small one or two patients in your practice that are unique, and yet you're not paying attention to their uniqueness as you try to manage them. Like with the uniqueness of having someone have a lower temperature when they are infected. You know, so this is where having persistence sometimes. Don't be angry at your physician's office, sometimes you will be, but just be persistent in pointing out, you know, the last time when this happened, this is what I experienced. Because we all can learn from your experiences, myself included. There was one more question before we moved on to the next slide. Yes, um, I have a really good uh, primary care physician, uh, so when I come, I used to be once a year for my physical until all this unfolded and now we're quite close. Um, so when I go in for a respiratory infection seems to be my weakness. Um, he will say it, it, looks, it doesn't look like it's bacterial, it looks like it's viral, so he'll do the Sudafed and maybe Flonase to treat the symptoms, give it a couple days and if it keeps on manifesting the antibiotic. However, when he's not available, someone else who's a little bit more... Um, not afraid of me, but doesn't know me, will more quickly say an antibiotic. So my question to you is, taking the antibiotics when not needed, does that impede my health so, uh, down the line being on Celsept and the other medications? So, so the question is, there's some variation in how your care has been going on, depending if it is your main go-to primary care physician 
or whether someone kind of is out of the office, he or she is out of the office, and then someone else is stepping in and helping you. When they don't know you, they get really overly nervous about it. Maybe they didn't go to the extreme of every infection is viral, but they went the other extreme. Golly, she's going to get in trouble from an infection. I'm not going to take any risk on this. So not knowing. So I have done things, management of patients that I know very well, quite differently from the first time that I know them. And the first time I know them, or they come to my office, I tend to be a little bit more you know, aggressive about dealing with every little symptom, whereas as you know them, you know the natural course of it, you know how the treatment response is, you know how low it can get, how bad it can get, in other words. So it gives you a comfort zone. You have that kind of working relationship. They know you're a reliable patient. They know that you will call if things change. So you lose that once you have a cross-covering physician. Sure. And that could explain very little. But your question is not that. Your question is, is that a bad thing to take too many antibiotics? And the answer is, this is probably the reason why people have shifted from giving for every viral infection antibiotics to being very selective because you start selecting out some bacteria and developing more resistant bacteria. Yes? Last question before we go. I said the last question, but we'll take one. I, I just want to comment, you know, before the interstitial lung disease and the polymyositis, before all that came out, I, I had doctors who didn't know me that well, and they were very aggressive with the treatment. And they were, you know, I was constantly getting infection, respiratory infections, bronchitis constantly. And they were constantly giving me antibiotics back to back until I ended up developing pseudomembrane colitis. Oh, yeah. And when I developed that, that's when the interstitial lung disease came out. That's when the polymyositis came out. That's when everything came out. And so for five years, they had to make sure I wasn't on any antibiotics after I was treated. You know, for the colitis, but you're right. You you know you have to get the physicians that really know know you, and you really have to know your body. That you know that that's so true. Now I have you know best best like best friends of physicians where they personally call me sometimes when I don't come in you know for an appointment or you know when they when, I, when they see another infection. So it is important to. Be really, you know, close to your doctors as well as knowing yourself. Excellent comments. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Yeah, that's one of the risks of membranes colitis. One last quick one. <laughs> <laughs> you want to wait till the end? Well, I wasn't sure if you were going to get to this possibly, um, but I wanted to ask you about the Lyme disease. Sure. Um, you know, so my my husband has DM, interstitial lung disease, and his doctor has been really. Um, cautious, I guess, and really protective of him and, you know, doesn't want him going to church with us, doesn't want him going to, like, malls or crowded places. Um, she said, like, school events for the, we have small kids, um, try to avoid those unless you really, it's something really important because she's concerned because he's so, his immune, he's so susceptible <laughs> to infection. Um, so when we came here, I expected to see, I thought, oh gosh, this is going to be the most people he's been around in a year. Um, and I expected to see a lot of people wearing their masks and stuff like that, and I, I haven't seen anyone. So I'm just wondering, um, I'm wondering if, you know, he's been a hermit for the last year for, I mean, are, are we being overly uh, cautious? Or? So your question will require a few minutes. Let's save it till the end. There's a Q&A session. So the question I'll remind me everyone, I don't want to forget, yeah. but the question is, should you be a hermit if you have uh, myositis and are doubly immune suppressed? Okay? We'll come back to that. Well, so, and if you're taking multiple immune suppressive uh, drugs, uh, the question is, infection is never a serious problem, maybe a serious problem, always is a serious problem. And then we know both that it can be one B or C, right? Nice. And the reason why it can be C is, can people die from infections? Yes. yes. This is from, this is the only medical based facts that I'll share with you. This is a retro look, meaning looking back at charts of 100 patients with dermatol, myositis. And they were taking different medications, prednisone, IVIG, azathioprine, which is Imuran, microfibrillate, morphotil, which is Celsa, 
or uh, methotrexate. And they were kind of distributed across the different treatments. And what I highlighted is two things. First, I'm part of this study, but the other part is that 5% uh, of the patients died from infections. So that's why it's important to take them seriously. And it, but the good news is 95% of the patients did not experience <laughs> of any of those serious things, but 5% is still pretty sizable. <coughs> So what about immunization? Anybody cares to hear about immunization? If you don't care about it, we'll skip this one. No. Okay, I, one yeah, person, yeah, two, yeah. not enough people, we'll skip it. <laughs> okay. should, we, should we get flu shots? So should, that, that's the question. Yeah. All vaccines are fine. No. 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 Only live vaccines no. are fine. No. Only live attenuated vaccines. Now they're attenuated, this is good, right? Only inactivated vaccines are fine. Which one? D. 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 Inactivated. So what is inactivated vaccine? What does it mean? Okay. So let us come back to this. Which are the inactivated vaccines? As you said correctly, it's an inactivated vaccine. That's the right answer. Shingles vaccine. Uh -huh. yeah. What is it? What's it's live. It's live attenuated. Yeah. Still, live is not a good thing. Even it's attenuated. The flu shot. Yes. Okay. Inactivated, yes. yes. You should get the flu shot. Not nasal. We come to that. That's good. <laughs> you read my mind. Thank you. <laughs> Pneumococcal vaccine. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's good. Yes, it's a good thing. Nasal flu vaccine. Yeah. No. It's live attenuated. Sometimes they're shortage of the flu shot, so your friendly primary care physician will say, you know what, yeah, it's I have this for you. It's going to be the cure. No, don't take it. <laughs> Meningococcal vaccine. Yes. Pertussis is okay. So this is the last slide, and we have five minutes for questions, we'll, do, uh, we'll answer first that question, but you have to be hyper-vigilant about symptoms of infection, that's kind of the obvious at the end of this conversation, uh, you know, uh, I think that's kind of the obvious point. You gotta be having a good working relationship with your primary care physician, interact with them, inform them, even if you're gonna wait for how the infection transpires, let them know, this is what I'm beginning, I'm gonna wait two, three days, I'll call you back if things turn differently. Keep them in the loop. Um, <clears throat> you might end up doing something that most patients will not undergo. You may be more likely to get antibiotics, but that is fine. And I think that in not taking live or live attenuated vaccines, you should get immunized. Now, you may ask me a question often, but I'm immunosuppressed. I'm taking a vaccine to uh, mount a immune response, will that be as good as if I'm not immunosuppressed? Will the immune response be as good? And the answer is no, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> high dose, or you got me there, high dose, low dose flu vaccine. We have a primary, retired primary care physician. I'm calling you a number. High, high dose. <laughs> the answer is high dose, according to the answer. So, um, I think now we can stop and have the first question. Should you be a hermit, right? Okay, so who thinks you should be a hermit if you have myositis and are immunosuppressed? It depends on your counts. It depends on your counts and what vacation you're on, because I needed to be a hermit for a while, and then as I got more stable and my counts were improved, then I didn't. So. I think it's okay. They're probably going off with this. Okay, it depends on the counts. That's one thing. Who, who else has? Well, I think we've got grandkids, and they bring from the daycare center every germ to mankind. So the best germs, right? Well, <laughs> they eat it, you know. But but that makes me real nervous because their noses are always running, they're coughing. So I, when the grandkids are over with the kitchen like that, I put on a mask and I. Try to get the rest of the family to do that too. Right, right. So is he overreacting? Is he being a hermit in doing this? No. He's doing the right thing. You don't want to be in, in, in a controlled environment. Your bank is, you know when they're going to come, you know when they're going to go, and you have a good contact with family members, you know if they have the crud or not. In this situation, you can 
control it in the way of wearing a mask, not being in close contact, not starting hugging and kissing them, and taking all the secretion, inhaling all their coughs. Right. Yeah, right. Changing diapers. Right, all these things you can avoid. Now, but what if they have a school event and there are 200 children you're going to sit amongst where you don't have a control situation? Should you go here? I still say yes. I'll still yes. say yes because you still need to live your life. Put the mask on and put, you know, wash your hands a lot. That's what I do. So. Right. Right. And we haven't, had, we haven't had school events yet. They're only so two everybody look, looks at the risk equation and they respond a little bit differently. If you have like this rampant infection going to the school, yeah. you probably don't want to go there. I think generally, if it's a preventable thing, it's not an essential event. I mean, all of this has to get back to them. Right. Uh, I've had one patient that I know of that got a letter from another physician to say he could only fly first class because going in second class, <laughs> you know, in, 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 in regular, you know, economy where we just expose them to too much risk of infection. So there's no good answer out there. There's so much variation. But my sense is, I think to be overproductive, I tell them, you know, someone has a crutch, stay away from them, even if it's your wife or uh, husband. Uh, if you're going to a broad event where you cannot control what the audience has. If you can sit in an area where you are kind of away from others, where you're in the back of the church, for example, assuming it's not that crowded. But if you see someone with an infection, you just have to walk out. They start coughing around you. You don't want to get that exposure. So it's a tough one. But I don't think you have to be hermit. Your lab parameters, as she pointed out, are important. Next question, we have about Two minutes left, so asked, 30 seconds. I should have asked this a ago. Um, what's your opinion about Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine? I didn't see that on your list. Plaquenil, Plaquenil important yeah. drug for dermatomyositis. Um, it kind of works for skin sometimes. I like it. Yeah. You have to check the eyes, however, right? Yeah. I, I travel a lot internationally for work. And there's huge differences in terms of the way people try to prevent infections. So in Asia, very often I'll see people wearing face masks. Is there any evidence that shows that it helps prevent? Because about eight times out of ten, I come back with a cough for a month. Yeah, I you still wear a face mask and come back with, with a no, cough. No, no. Uh, people in that I've seen other passengers wearing it. I myself don't, and I, I don't see passengers when I travel uh, elsewhere. And I'm wondering if in, within Asia has any research been done to show that that's effective. Or is it just a cultural difference that people feel better that they're I have taking the ignorance. If anybody in the audience knows the answer, yes. I don't know the answer to that question in the sense that I don't know if this study has been done of that sort. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I got the shingle shot a number of years ago because the rheumatologist at that time said there was a little window where they decided it was okay. So was there a study to prove that then well, again it wasn't? It, there's a little window, which means the dose of prednisone matters and how much you're taking it, how often you're taking it matters. So generally speaking, you say no, but it's a low dose prednisone for a short period of time, you have a window. Okay. Yes. Um, I went to the lecture on exercise and myositis, and they did mention that it may aid in um, fighting infection. Or boosting immune system. I was just wondering what your experience is with that with patients. And I was kind of kidding when I said yoga and immune suppressive system mm -hmm. because exercise probably is beneficial to your immunity. Okay? You deal with stress better and stress is not good for your immune system. Once you exercise you have so I do think that there's a benefit, but the point I was trying to make is you cannot fight the infection on a one-to-one -one basis. Right, you can't with, fight it but... with exercise, but it's generally good for you, good for myositis. As a matter of fact, early on, there have been some concerns that muscle is inflamed. Why exercise? It's going to damage it. The answer is totally wrong. You can start exercise early on in the treatment of myositis. If the weakness is severe, you have to do lesser exercise intensity, but you have to graduate the intensity as you get stronger and stronger with treatment. Yes? One last question. Two last questions. Okay. Um, I'm on Rituxan infusions. And I was wondering, can you get the flu shot with Rituxan? Can you get the flu shot with Rituxan? That's the uh, question. I think that you should be able to. I think that you should be able to, yes. Last question. Um, if you get an infection, like a cold, and you're on methotrexate, 
does it make any sense to lower your dose a little? Should you, should you lower your dose while if you have an infection of something? It depends how bad the infection is. If it's just the infection that's putting you like coughing and maybe staying at home, that's one thing. But in the hospital, on IV drugs, you probably will have your physician stop the medication <coughs> temporarily or reduce the dose. So it depends on the severity of the infection. Okay. Thanks everybody for your My name is Chris Harris. I have uh, dermatomyositis. I was first diagnosed in 2005. So this is my 12th year. And this is my first year to this meeting, which I'm kicking myself for. But going forward, I'll be at every one. Um, my favorite part of this meeting is meeting the patients and their advocates. And I'm amazed at the support that I've received since I've been here from everybody. And I love that people have shared their stories, no matter how challenging, but I love the idea of hope for everybody. And my second favorite part of this meeting is the individuals have, who have donated their time to move this disease forward and try to find a cure, which includes everybody with the Myositis Foundation as well as the panel. Every person who has volunteered their time, the physicians, the physical therapists, the volunteers, and the fact that they've committed to do this as they move forward is amazing to me. And I love it, and I will be here again next year and the year after that. And it just gives me a lot of hope when I was very depressed. So thank you for inviting us, thank you for supporting it, and I look forward to seeing everybody next year. Hello, my name is Anastasia Victorson, and I came here all the way from Stockholm, Sweden. I'm very happy to be here. Is this of course, your first time coming to uh, To this conference, yes, to the TMA conference the first time. What's it been like? It's been fantastic, very informative. I've met my friends, my Facebook friends, and uh, I think, I hope I'll be able to come again. Um, I have polymyositis, but I also have a syndrome that's called the anti-synthesis syndrome. Uh, I have antibodies, a lot of them, but anti jo one is the most common one. And I also have ILD, quite serious. But getting medication, feeling quite okay. The doctor saved my life. Yeah. Very good information. And it's also nice to see the persons I read a lot. It's also nice to see them in real life, to be able to interact with the doctors. Yes, I'm just happy to be here, having met you too. Take care. And everybody else that hasn't been here, hasn't gotten a chance, please try, because this was really worth it. It's beyond my expectations, really. <laughs>